Hey guys, I'm Sun. I'm a privacy and a security researcher, and you're watching The Privacy Guides. Uh, last episode on how browser extensions can be dangerous for our privacy spawned many interesting conversations, many of which leading to a fundamental question that is, who can we trust? Which apps can we trust? And that's such an interesting question, and it will be the subject of today's episode. But before I go ahead and jump into the nitty gritty details as usual, I wanna say thanks to you guys. Together, we're developing a really interesting community that appears to care about privacy. And uh, amongst us, we're sharing a bunch of ideas, and that's really cool. So thanks, guys, and a few girls for being part of the conversation. Uh, by the way, I wish there were more girls or women uh, part of this channel uh, because privacy should be on everyone's mind. But nonetheless, thanks. Um, now, some of you are sharing these episodes outside of YouTube, and I just wanted to say that I'm totally okay with it. And as a matter of fact, I'm actually thankful that you guys are doing that because privacy should be on everyone's minds. It's such an important uh, issue right now for us as a society. So please do share them everywhere you want. This message is so important. The more people we can reach with it, the better. So thanks for that. Uh, yeah, so back to today's episode. Um, how do great privacy apps remove trust from the equation is a very interesting question. And I have a few notes here, by the way. I have them because I want to make sure that this train of thought is concise. Uh, so yeah, most great apps use uh, a few of these uh, technologies, if not all of them, to protect us and themselves. Uh, I'm talking about on-device encryption. So when you're using a cloud service provider, uh, say you're using you know, Amazon or Google or Dropbox, well, great uh, apps will actually encrypt the information using an encryption key that only you have, and they'll do that on the device. Uh, that means that if ever they're subpoenaed, well, they have nothing to reveal about you because all of your data is encrypted. Yes, that data can be brute forced, and that's where using good passwords is really important. But nonetheless, it's a really great move uh, for privacy. Second, end-to-end -end encryption. That one we've heard often, that's what Signal uses. Great apps that are used for communication will actually encrypt the message at your end and only the recipient, the intended recipient, can decrypt it. So that's end-to-end -end encryption. Not to be confused with HTTPS or TLS, which is an encrypted tunnel, but the message can be deciphered at the other end because it's unclear. So uh, that's end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, extensive peer review and open source code. Uh, that one we've discussed in last episode. It's not because a project is open source that it's actually good for our privacy. If no one is trying to poke holes into the code, if no one is reviewing the code, uh, well, it's not worth much. Uh, and it's pretty much the same as being proprietary. That's where uh, apps such as Firefox or Signal really score high. There's a whole bunch of security researchers and academics that are trying to poke holes into that. Um, ephemeral data retention policy. Companies that you know are in the messaging business, for instance, uh, they're not obliged because of the service that they're providing to store information forever at their end. Once, a, once the conversation is uh, has been dispatched, well, why would they actually you know keep a copy on their servers? Uh, well, in the case of Signal, they don't. Uh, and then anonymized telemetry. So a lot of the apps, as you saw in last episode, have Google Analytics or a whole bunch of other analytics suites that will capture a whole bunch of data on how we use the app, but unfortunately also what we use the app for. And that's what I really have a problem with. And great apps will uh, most of the time tend to use telemetry and Signal and Firefox does but they allow us to really easily disable it. And as you saw in the episodes on how to set up Firefox for privacy or how to use Signal on your phone, that's something I tend to disable. But bear in mind that these, uh, these telemetrics, if that's a word, are used by those developers to find bugs. And it's kind of helpful that a bunch of people with maybe less sensitive use cases actually do provide telemetry. 
Um, so I wanted to uh, move or not move, but like not end because I can ramble a while on this stuff, but I wanted to talk to you guys about the Firefox case study, the Signal case study, and the Arc case study, which is uh, that last one, a proprietary piece of software. And I want to explain how I think about those things. So in the case of Firefox, well, Firefox uses telemetry, but it can be disabled. Uh, Firefox uses on-device encryption for Firefox, Firefox sorry, Sync. Uh, so yeah, let me show this off here a bit. If you go in the documentation of Firefox Sync, um, it uses Firefox account for it uses Firefox accounts for account authentication and key management. All data is encrypted and decrypted on each device. No sync data is ever transmitted to our servers without being encrypted. Mozilla does not hold any keys to your sync data. So that's a good cloud implementation. And unfortunately, most people that offer cloud solutions, they mention encryption, but what they really mean is the information is encrypted on their hard drives in the data center, but obviously they have the keys so they can decipher that information. Encryption that truly protects our privacy is either end-to-end -end encryption that's well implemented or on-device encryption that's well implemented. Everything else, including in-transit encryption or at-rest encryption, which means essentially HTTPS or encrypting the hard drives in the data centers, well, that's good to protect it from some forms of uh, infosec or opsec threats but it's not really that good for other things. By the way, if you don't know what OPSEC versus InfoSec is, uh, I'll link an episode up here or here and I'll add in the description on uh, explaining that. Whew, okay. Now, next up, um, so I have little notes here, sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, so Firefox also uh, is extensively peer reviewed and open source. So the code is available for everyone to audit and there's hundreds of contributors to the code. Actually, I'm pulling that number out of my ass. I don't know the exact number, but I'm pretty damn sure that there's at least 100, if not many more. Now, the Signal case study is actually very interesting. So Signal uses state-of-the-art end-to-end encryption to make sure that when you send a message to someone, it's actually encrypted on your device and it's only dec de decryptable, decipherable by the intended recipient. And the way they do this is using a whole bunch of you know, encryption strategies that are based on Diffie-Hellman. So essentially there's a key exchange that's done between you and that recipient, and only you can encrypt, uh, only that recipient can decrypt the information that you're encrypting using their public key. Uh, if you wanna learn more about public key cryptography, it's such a fascinating subject. Computer File, another YouTube chain that if you're not following it, you should probably, uh, has amazing episodes on that. I'll link one in the description. Whew, this this is so exciting for me. I I I not even I'm not even breathing. Oh God. Okay. So um, yeah. So uh, Signal is also extensively peer reviewed and open source. Uh, if we go here on the computer, as you can see, uh, actually, sorry about that. Uh, oh yeah. I actually didn't open the link here. Jesus, son. Not good. Not good. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, the code is extensively peer reviewed. As you can see here, this is the iOS branch of Signal. Uh, it's had 17,000 commits, so it's a very active project. You can see that the last one was like two days ago. That means that it's not only uh, open source, but it's also an active project. We can see that there's 91 contributors. And the cool thing with GitHub and other repositories is you can actually go and see who these people are. And once you know who they are, you can actually uh, do a little bit of background check to see if you know these people are good actors and stuff like that. So that's super cool. Now, uh, a last thing about the Signal uh, case study, I could talk about Signal all day long, but they have uh, what I like to call an ephemeral data retention policy. What that means is they don't keep your data for longer that they need to supply the given service in the way you in, in the way you imagine it. So like you're, so Signal, you're sending a message to someone, you know that, you know, if you're using Signal, you care about privacy. So you don't want Signal to store a copy of that message on their servers, even if it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Because as I mentioned in the case of Firefox, well, the information is on their servers and it stays on their servers because you're synchronizing devices and stuff like that. So if Firefox is subpoenaed, they could hand over the encrypted version of your data. And if that includes all of your browsing history, for instance, well, someone could have pretty good insights on what kind of shit you're browsing. That's why I recommend never enabling Firefox Sync, but nonetheless, we have to give them credit. Now for Signal, 
they bring that to a whole other level. If we look at their privacy policy here on the computer, it says Signal cannot decrypt or otherwise access the content of your messages or calls. Signal queues end-to-end -end encrypted messages on its servers for delivery to devices that are temporarily uh, offline. What that means is, uh, and yeah, your history, uh, your message history is stored on your own devices. Whew. What that means is they don't keep copies of messages on their servers because they don't want to keep copies on their servers because if they're subpoenaed, they cannot hand over data that they don't have. And that's exactly the way privacy conscious apps should operate. And that's why personally, I don't like using the cloud to store my data. I prefer storing it locally. Now, bear in mind that even locally, someone that wanted to have access to it could uh, get a warrant and you know come in my house and get my hard drives. But nonetheless, I prefer uh, having it that way. It makes it a little harder uh, to access my data. Now, um, one last case study, and the reason why I'm throwing this one in is because Arc, uh, which is, by the way, a backup app that backs up your data incrementally on the cloud or on you know hard drives, USB thumb drive, stuff like that. Well, it's not open source. And you may ask, son, why do you trust a non-open source piece of software? Well, that will be the subject of a future episode because uh, as I like to say, you can only give so many fucks a day without going nuts. And I decided to limit my number of fucks on that. I'm using a Mac, which people could complain about as well. And it's a legitimate complaint. So I'm trying to find an equilibrium between convenience and total privacy and security, which by the way, does not exist. So I'm totally cool with, you know, paying for apps. And that's important, paying for apps. If an app is free, we're probably the product. But ARC is something that you pay for. It's a one-time fee and it does on-device encryption. What I mean here is my data before being uploaded to a cloud provider of my choice is encrypted on my device. So obviously ARC could have some kind of a backdoor in the code that could you know, send my information out. That being said, I use an application layer firewall and I prevent ARC from sending information to places that I don't control. More on application layer firewalls in a future episode. If you're into that, smash that subscribe button and we're gonna get there. Now, the other thing that Arc supplies, and that has to do with sovereignty, is it does provide us with, at least, I don't know if this is available, by the way, in Arc version six, I'm running Arc version five for the time being, but it does provide a recovery app that is totally open source, that not only allows us to extract our data from backups if ever either ARC goes bankrupt or if they're no longer a good player or if we no longer want to pay, although it's a lifetime license, so I don't see why that would be an issue. But essentially, it also allows us to peek at the code and see what kind of encryption scheme is going on and is that something that we consider good. So uh, one last thing, governance. ARC is developed by Stefan. He's one of our peers. He looks like a lovely human being that really cares. He's been in the backup software business for 10 years, and there's only good things I can say about Stefan. So I hope this episode was insightful in better understanding the process of uh, researching why or you know why can we trust a specific app or a specific company. Um, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you're new to this channel, smash that subscribe button and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.